Light in Scotland has a quality I've not met elsewhere. It is luminous without being fierce, penetrating to immense distances with an effortless intensity. In the final years of the Second World War, a lecturer in English who'd lived almost her whole life in the Eastern Highlands of Scotland wrote the last lines of a book. That book would become one of the great masterpieces of 20th century nature writing, but not for a while. For 30 years, the manuscript sat in a drawer, unpublished, untouched, unread. Often, the mountain gives itself most completely when I have no destination, when I reach nowhere in particular, but have gone out merely to be with the mountain as one visits a friend, with no intention but to be with him. The author was Nan Shepherd, and the book was The Living Mountain. When it finally reached readers, the book was a revelation. It offered a sensuous, intimate, achingly authentic portrait of a landscape, a whole new way of looking at and thinking about nature. As I penetrate more deeply into the mountain's life, I penetrate also into my own. For an hour, I am beyond desire. It is not ecstasy, that leap out of the self that makes man like a god. I am not out of myself, but in myself. I am. In this film, we are looking at Scottish nature writing today in the third decade of the 21st century. What does it mean to be a nature writer on the razor's edge of a climate crisis, in the heart of a pandemic? In her latest collection of essays and in a new anthology, award-winning poet and author Kathleen Jamie is asking these very questions. You're sheltering in a cave, thinking about the Ice Age. From the cave mouth, a West Highland landscape in spring, in the early Anthropocene. On the hillside opposite, six red deer have bedded down in the heather. It's raining, a soft highland rain, a smurr. You sit at the cave mouth, looking out at the rain, thinking about the Ice Age. You realise you haven't a clue. We can wait, see the hills. Take your time. I think of myself as a writer first, not a nature writer, not a woman writer, not a Scottish writer, just a writer. And where the work wants to go, there I have to follow. So in recent years, I've been thinking about the natural world and that's where the writing has wanted to, to go and explore. So that's where I've followed it. The reason I wanted to, to make Antlers of Water was to find out if we had a specifically Scottish nature writing and to find out what, what that might consist in. And so I did ask um, as diverse a bunch of people, I think there's 20 writers in the book, from Shetland to Galloway, different class backgrounds, which matters to me, different um, ethnic backgrounds come together. All we have in common is that we live in Scotland. All we have in common is the world around us. Let's see what we come up with. As we realise we must halt destruction, reduce emissions and renegotiate our relationship with the natural world, our noticing is a vital contribution. Out of our noticing comes our art and our writing. For me, this noticing and caring, this attention, this writing from within personal circumstances, whether about an insect or a mountain, amounts to a political act. Politics is power, it's about a power dynamic. That's what I mean by politics. Anything with a power dynamic is political. And when we have absolute power over the furtherance of every other species on the planet, that's political. You know? So every time we notice another species, every time we give it space, every time we admit it into our consciousness, giving it, we can't say giving it voice, or perhaps we can. That has to be a political act. Noticing as a political act is a subtle but powerful idea. In the new wave of Scottish nature writing, there's an insistent urge to give voice to the voiceless, to the places and species that can't speak for themselves, rewilding language, just as some, like author Jim Crumley, would seek to rewild the landscape. It occurs to me now, with five years and four books finally behind me, that as our planet lurches crazily towards the unknown, there's one thing, and one thing only, that we have to do to stop the chaos. And it's very, very simple. We have to learn to think beyond self. 
In Scotland, where I ply my trade, I'm as certain as I can ever be that nature would like us to put back the wolf and let its benevolence flow across the land. A symbol, a smoke signal telling the wild world that finally we have begun to think beyond self. Nature writing's got a job to do, and obviously good books and good uh, nature writing in any shape or form, it can provide a kind of uh, mouthpiece for uh, nature, for nature's needs, for nature's ideas. But it's no substitute for immersing yourself in nature and for living it and breathing it. My favourite writer is George Mackay Brown, and George Mackay Brown was talking about poetry and he said, um, there's no such thing as a good poem or a bad poem. There's only a poem or there's a mess of words on the page. And uh, I think that applies to nature writing as well. So I wouldn't worry too much about uh, how you define good nature writing. It's there, you know, if you read it and you respond to it and it moves you, it's good nature writing. I think nature writing has a duty to address the climate crisis. It's our job to, to say, look, look at this. This is what's happening. This is happening now. This is the only planet we've got. Uh, and as far as we know, we're not going to get another one. All the signs are there that we're very close to reaching some kind of tipping point beyond which the planet, as we know it, can't recover. It's uh, a duty of a nature writer to say that as often and as loudly and as persuasively as, um, as possible. There's nothing more important. Nature's all there is. Yeah. Scotland's new nature writers are exploring the boundaries of what nature can mean. Rather than indulging old cliches of wilderness and romanticism, they're reclaiming Scotland's landscapes as spaces to confront changing lives and circumstances in an uncertain modern world. And so, for Chitra Ramaswamy, writing about nature can mean writing about the shifting landscape of your own body. I decided for my contribution uh, for Antlers of Water to write a kind of trilogy of meditations. And the first one is specifically about a walk that I did not complete. So instead of writing about, you know, an experience of walking, it's about what happens when you don't do the walk. How do you retain that memory in your mind? The following day, we decided to attempt a nearby walk to the coral beach at Ardban. Two women, one heavily pregnant, a four-year-old boy on the brink of massive change, a sister and a fortnight after her birth, an autism diagnosis. My pelvic girdle, that butterfly-shaped cluster of bones pinned to the mouth of the spine, was killing me, producing a rhythmic grinding when I walked that felt as though it would be ground to dust in the same way a butterfly's wings crumble to nothing. Finally, I refused to continue and sat on a rock overlooking a small sheltered bay where one immediately pictured seals basking, though there were none. We turned back, defeated, but also aware that we had wished for more of the world than we could handle that day. In some ways, nature writing, or perhaps what I thought nature writing was, um, maybe 10, 20 years ago, um, I, I sort of associate it with the kind of a, a, a reveling in nature, that kind of old sort of transcendental experience of, you know, the sublime, um, being in a mountainscape and feeling, you know, sort of in some way very small or insignificant or the, these ideas of nature somehow being separate from us, something that we admire and that has an impact upon us. And I just think we're in a different place in the world now. We can no longer just sit and revel in the kind of transcendental beauty of nature. There has to be some acknowledgement of what we have done um, to the world and that produces both kind of feelings of, you know, guilt and grief and loss and sadness, but also a real valuing of, you know, actually we really care. The notion with, uh, with nature writing being about the sort of the, the immediate world around you, 
um, is very much the ideas uh, that I used when I was writing my first book, Expecting, which is a kind of nine-month chronicle of pregnancy and birth, and was about the pregnancy that I, that I had with my first child, my son. And I decided to approach that book as um, a form of nature writing, but instead of using landscape, I almost treated the pregnant body as a landscape. On Shetland, at Scotland's far northern extreme, poet Roseanne Watt looks for the nature that can be found within the language itself. Her award-winning work mixes English with Shetland, a dialect shaped by the sea roads and the island landscapes. A dialect which, as Roseanne says, is as hard and open as the ocean, with words that hold the wilderness, or at least its memory, inside them. There was e time when my man was after fishing, and he was coming in, but must was come that stick it that he could hardly see his hand before his face. And then, all of a sudden, there was a wave at camp, and then he realised, I came for him up, I just did it. Follow this wave, and this wave will tap me in to the shore. What drew me to nature writing in the first place was that kind of need to put down on the page what I was seeing and there's a sense of preservation but also of figuring out the world <laughs> around you. I always tend to quote Mark Doty's essay about the way our metaphors seem to function and I find a lot of my metaphors are best expressed through the natural world. I like this idea of being perceptive to what surrounds you as a kind of connection between the internal and the external. It's about um, possession and being possessed by the land itself. Books really are important in keeping connections with nature alive. It goes beyond just the physical experience there's a, a kind of mental connection you need as well, and that can be achieved through reading and writing. Nature writing often zooms in on the tiniest details, finding whole worlds within the everyday incidentals that we can all miss. But it can also be global and universal, offering routes that lead from physical landscapes to psychological ones, mapping the uncertain territory of the human condition. In his new book, writer and doctor Gavin Francis journeys across oceans and continents and through his own life in search of both isolation and connection. Hitchhiking north through the islands of Shetland, a Land Rover stopped for me. The driver was a man of about 40. He wore a gas blue boiler suit and his beard was flecked with white. Where are you bound, he asked, with a voice like rust and sea spray, an accent more Norse than Scots. Unst, I said. He told me that off the island of Unst, the northernmost of the Shetland Islands, a black-browed albatross had been seen, a species accustomed to the skerries of the sub-Antarctic. It must have crossed the equator in a storm, he said, and got disorientated, took one look at Unst and thought, that looks like home. I was in search of distant islands, in love with the idea that on a patch of land, protected by a circumference of sea, the obligations and the irritations of life would dissolve and a singular clarity of mind would descend. It proved more complicated than that. The Book Island Dreams I wrote because I wanted to write a very different kind of travel book. I wanted to write a book which, rather than be about one particular journey, was actually about the journey of a lifetime, looking at a theme that has recurred throughout my life. I work as a doctor, I work in very kind of busy, hectic urban environments quite a lot of the time, and it's been a recurring theme for me to, to retreat almost to places of, of quite extreme isolation in order somehow to rebalance my life between the, the periods of intense work in the city and then these other periods of almost recuperation and recalibration. And so I wanted to write a different kind of book which explored 
those journeys across a whole lifetime in very short, condensed kind of fragments of prose. And interspersed too with all sorts of maps of these places showing the way the islands have been imagined and reimagined over the centuries. Every area has its own history, its own culture, its own geography and the, the writing of that area feeds into it. And so Scottish nature writing, of course, is um, it's evolved and emanates from this land, this culture, this geography that we inhabit. So in that way, it's special. Some of my books you could define as nature writing, some of my books you could define as travel writing, some of them you could define as medical writing, but they're all trying to do the same thing. They're all trying to map out and explore landscapes in a way that I hope can expand the reader's imagination and take them to places that otherwise they would never ever have the opportunity to see. Bone caves, dream islands, mother waves, motherhood, wild words, landscapes that vanish, landscapes that return. The subjects being approached by Scottish nature writers today are incredibly broad and diverse, yet they all share the same sense of immediacy and urgency, an awareness that noticing brings with it the risk at some point in the future of not noticing, of seeing something right up until the moment that it's gone. Their work shows that nature and the modern world are not somehow separate, but interlinked. They're one and the same. That nature's not an escape from our present circumstances. It is our present circumstances. Through these writers and many more emerging in Scotland right now, you can, as Nan Shepherd put it, penetrate more deeply into nature's life. And as a result, more deeply into your own you can start really noticing. And the thing is, once you start, it's almost impossible to stop. Publishing Scotland is the support body for the publishing sector in Scotland. The following books, authors and publishers all featured in this film. Surfacing by Kathleen Jamie is published by Sort Of Books. Antlers of Water, edited by Kathleen Jamie is published by Canongate. The Nature of Summer by Jim Crumley is published by Saraband. Motor Die by Roseanne Watt is published by Polygon. Expecting by Chitra Ramaswamy is published by Saraband. Island Dreams by Gavin Francis is published by Canongate. Scotland from the Sky by James Crawford is published by Historic Environment Scotland. And The Living Mountain by Nan Shepherd is published by Canongate. To find out more and to explore a wide selection of the best books and writing from Scotland today, go to booksfromscotland.com. <laughs>